after hardware, we're going to talk a little bit more about different frameworks. So we know that's a bunch of frameworks. The X axis, the years. And um, so you can see that Ciano Cafe, Cafe is from Berkeley, and a lot of new things, especially there's four frameworks at uh, three years ago and the other things. So we're going to briefly introduce like each framework, what is the uh, major design decisions and what is the, the advantage and disadvantages. The first one is Cafe. Cafe is made from Berkeley. It's the, the most popular deep learning framework for computer vision about four years ago. So the program interface is, is that you give me a product buff. Uh, you can write a text and describe the layer. And for example, this is the part of the ResNet 100, 101 uh, network, how to define the layers. So we have layers, we have what is the bottom layer, what's the top layer, and the tab, and also parameters here. So the, the one thing here is that Cafe have really good CV model coverage. It's a bunch of convolution networks we're going to teach in the next week. And it's portable, which means it's a, it's a single binary. You can grab it and run everywhere. But it's not so flexible at that time if you want to do like a Python level interactive program. It's so hard. And also, this layer, I didn't show the whole thing. Actually, this, the single definition have 4,000 lines of code, which means a for a single layer, a for a single network. After that, like TensorFlow is probably the most popular deep learning framework right now. It provides domain-specific language it's called DSL for Python. So TensorFlow is, is like Python, but not Python. So you have, you, it has a thousand operators. So that's actually the advantage you have everything you want for, to use in TensorFlow. It also have a lot of features. Uh, you want to do training, do deployment, do everything you want. But the problem here is that TensorFlow's code is a little bit hard to understand. If you don't learn, learn that before, it's a Python users. If, for example, you read this code, you don't know what is state OP's dot assignments. It's actually equals to. <laughs> um, but uh, well, it's a little bit hard to understand. Keras, on the other hand, it's a front-end. It's just the one designed to simplify how to de develop things. For example, here's how to using Keras to define a multi-layer perception. It's pretty similar to what we have in Groom before. Um, Keras is just a front-end. You can use a different back-end. So for example, you can, in default, you can use, originally use Ciano, now it's using TensorFlow. You can also use Amstand or CNTKS backends. So the advantage the one, the one of Keras is like, it's pretty easy to use compared to TensorFlow. But it may be slower because you have a little bit overhead on the front end, and then you turn into a TensorFlow program, you have a little bit more efficiency at the end. It's less convenient to develop it, debug because you see, the, you see there's a compile step here. In define model, you compile it. It's actually called symbolic programming. We talked a little bit about before, like it's a bit harder to get the intermediate result and to do interactive things. The other one is pretty popular called PyTorch. It's PyTorch is from PyTorch. PyTorch actually grabbed the tensor, uh, tensor interface from Torch and also grab a neural network interface from Channel. So it's purely in Python, so which means it's pretty easy to understand. If you, you're a Python user, you, you can read PyTorch code easily. And because it's so closely integrated with Python, PyTorch is a little bit hard to deploy, especially for industrial applications. Sometimes your application is writing in Java, while you need to run Python in Java, that's pretty painful. And if you want to run mobile phones, you not necessarily have Java, which is have a lot of uh, efficiency issues. So, but PyTorch is so easy to use, it's getting very popular in research words. So this class is based on MSNet. The original MSNet have a Lumpy-like tensor library, which is, you already see that before, it's called ND. It kind of like chaos-like neural network. It's symbolic, which means you define network, you compile it, and fit data in the trend. The original design for MSNet is for performance. We want to get the best performance, so then we sacrifice a little bit of usability. At that time, people don't know, how, 
still, it's still earlier, a lot a small community, everybody's expert, so we don't care about usability at that time. After that, like the com community growth, like PyTorch, like uh, it's 10 times easier to use than TensorFlow, but we learned, yes, let's have a PyTorch-like <laughs> thing. So Gluon is actually very similar to Chain and PyTorch for new networks. So here we define network, and then we can do the, this is a normal thing we introduced before. So Gluon make much easier and to develop code and debug, which is similar to PyTorch, but comparing to the symbolic interface, sometimes slower because you lose a little bit performance for the interactive experience using Python. But in most cases, you don't care. Unless you are a separate driving car company, you have like a lot of 4K videos and you really care about performance, that matters. But in most cases, for homeworks, you don't care about that. So that's kind of what we have two years ago. And what we really learned in the last two years, like where more and more students come in and engineers come in, the less care about the framework. It's just a tool. Framework is a tool that lets you to finish things. So for example, for researchers, they really want to have baseline models already implemented so I can based on the baseline model to just hack it and train, train my own applications. And for engineers, I really care about let's grab a data, train the model and deploy. And that's really I care about. So start from one year ago, we're trying to, okay, let's have toolkits actually focus on applications. For example, one thing is called Gluon CV. This is a toolkit for computer vision. It provides a bunch of image classifications, all these popular models here, object detection, somatic segmentation, a lot of segmentation, also like uh, uh, phase, GAN, a lot of stuff. So it has a bunch of pre trained models. You can just grab and use it. Also, it has all these training scripts to reproduce the results. The reproducing results are pretty hard because like, to make your paper fancy, you need to say a lot of fancy things, but to get the result, you have a lot of tricks. So um, for example, a lot of famous papers we're, gonna, we're also going to teach in the class claim that, yes, let's design a network. I uh, have this story, and, um, and like, we outperform the baseline by maybe 5%. Oh, that's a big thing, and people jump in. Yeah, that's so fancy. But at, at in fact, we we look into that, look into the implementation. We find the major trick give you like three percent improvement is like for softmax, either you give zero for negative, one for positive. So and but for the you know that for the softmax regression to fit zero and one is too hard. And what you can do is like you can change the positive number to from zero for one to zero point nine, and change the negative to zero to zero to from zero to zero point one. It's called soft label, and this one gives you like three percent improvement. Like okay, there are a lot of tricks to make things happen, and um, so this tool is trying to yes, let's survey all the tricks and find apply all the tricks to all these models. You can actually get a lot of good things from it. So also, this is um, there's a bunch of projects, like yes, how about let's grab a data set, find you a model for that. Um, our feedback feedback is like yeah, it's a homework project because you just grab it and the two or three lines of code you can just find you. That's so easy. Similarly, we have LP, a lot of uh, pre-trained models, scripts, and do a lot of NLP jobs, especially if if you read the news, there's a new algorithm called BIRDS, or transformer-based network, very pretty popular, and also from uh, OpenAI called GP, uh, GPT-2, like, you get a lot of good results. It's, it's very, it's a big thing for, um, for NLPs. So originally, we probably don't ta teach transformer BIRDS too much, but according to the rest of the news, we maybe take one, two lectures for BIRDS or transformer models. The other one, uh, we, uh, you guys have a, pro have a team to do graph neural networks. So, which means you can take social, gra uh, social graph data set, you can talk, uh, take uh, some recommendation data set, you can build kind of relational neural network for that. DGL is for that. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's a relatively new research topic. Um, every framework uh, is just the beginning, 
as pretty, uh, it's pretty slow at this time, but we are moving very fast on this area. So every framework's pretty move fast in the past few years. For example, for Amstrad, we will have more toolkits this year. And the other thing we learned is like, for the first homework, we get feedback. Yes, uh, you told me ND array is NumPy like, but it's actually not compatible. If, for example, if you do bool indexing, it actually doesn't support that. So yes, we, we take this feedback, and now we're gonna deprecate ND maybe in a year, and then introduce a new package called NP, it's 100% NumPy compatible, which means we are gonna add in GPU support to NumPy and also autograd to NumPy. So that's like, again, if, if may, maybe next year we're gonna teach again at Berkeley, we can connect, yes, use NumPy, and it can, it's just use NumPy. The second area we see that, yes, people care about performance, like for CPU and the GPU, and we are able to using compiler technologies to, for the compiler actually we can see the whole network and do the graph, the network scale optimizations. Even on CPU and GPU, we can get another 50% uh, performance boost. And more, interest, uh, more importantly, more and more deep learning applications are gonna run on edge or mobile phones on the ASIC. So we hope, we hope at the end of this year, we'll cover more hardware as well. And another question like, yes, my laptop have a GPU, why can I use my GPU on my la laptop? Sorry, you are not, you should use Mac, you, you don't have NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, you maybe have Intel GPUs. But now, maybe at the end of this year, people can run all uh, GPU code on the Intel or AMD GPUs. Okay, so on the rest of it, let's give a few tutorials about Gruom. Um, we already talked about the NDR interface, now we talk a little bit more about how to write neural networks. So there's three things here, how to create and define neural networks and layers, and how to initialize and manipulate the parameters. And the last one, because we're gonna start into this convolutional neural networks in next week, we probably prefer to use GPUs. For multi-layer perceptions, your laptop is maybe good enough, but for convolutional neural networks, CPU is too, too slow.